Hello learners, hope you are having a wonderful day. So today we start with the course on labor welfare and industrial relations. In the introduction video if you have seen, you would have come across a certain nuances of this course. I had categorically explained why we need such a course, what is the relevance of this course, what are the underlying situations which demanded the rise of industrial relations or uh, you know as a measure of labor welfare. So all these aspects I'll try to justify and uh, give you some substance with respect to the understanding of the entire plot of labor, labor welfare and industrial relations. So that will be module one. We'll be looking into what industrial relations is all about and why we need to study this. I am Dr. Abraham Cyril Isaac. I am a faculty at the School of Business, Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. So when we look into this course, Labor Welfare and Industrial Relations specifically, we have to understand and acknowledge the background of how industrial relations came up as a discipline or as scope to study, as a discipline and as a, as a field of study. So when we are looking into industrial relations, we have to acknowledge the fact that in situations where there are oppression, there are exploitation, there are problems with respect to a manager and an employee, there are issues with respect to uh, unhygienic working condition or maybe situations which demand or warrant a better safe working condition. Industrial relations and labor welfare happens to be the key word or the buzzword. So this is where we have to acknowledge the fact that over the period in time as mass production came up and then a lot of workforce or a lot of workers joined the workforce and the workforce increased tremendously there came up problems and to resolve these problems there came up unions or let's say formation of formal or informal organizations which supported the cause of these individuals or workers individual workers specifically those were represented there was a lot of uh, conflicts there were a lot of arguments engagements there were a lot of interactions deliberations and finally we have a robust structure of industrial relations. So that's, that's pretty much the background of what has happened. But let's go into the detail. Let's understand specifically, what do you mean by industrial relations? No, there are a lot of different definitions associated with industrial relations. But in the background, you should categorically remember one thing which I have stressed and underscored in my introduction video that there are two entities specifically. One, the employer, another, the employee. So all the interactions, all the deliberations, all the contacts, all the engagements happening between these two entities specifically contribute to what is called as industrial relations. Now we have different uh, ways to look into it, different lenses are used to uh, focus on this particular association or interrelationship. So let's start with the first definition by Dale Yoder. Now industrial relations specifically is described as relationships between management and employee or specifically among employees and their organizations that characterize or grow out of employment. So the context here is employment. The context here is an, a, a formal organization whereby people come to work, they work for maybe for salary, for wages, maybe for other benefits, but they, they come to a particular place to work. There's a formal setting of an organization and this is how the interaction happens between the management and the employees specifically. Now, according to John Dunlop, Industrial societies necessarily create industrial relations defined as complex interrelations among managers, workers and agencies of government. So if you look into the whole change of dimension, so there, it was two dimensional in the initial phase. One was with respect to the employer, so let's take it as manager. Second was with respect to the employee, so maybe the representation from the employees or maybe the employee itself. But then there's a third dimension being added by John Dunlop, which is nothing but the government, the authority, the authority in power. So the government also understood that when a large set of workforce is being affected or let's say is part of a problem, then it is 
it is their owners or it is upon them to actually get involved and solve. So this is a third dimension that is coming into picture and every single industrial relations effectively if you ask me has an element of government associated with it no doubt. So let's look into the role of uh, industrial relations if somebody asks us or somebody tells us please do not undermine the role of the government of the day or the role of the government of the particular region in actually solving a particular issue, in actually influencing a particular issue or maybe even to actually bring out laws so that the issues will not arise in the first place. So this is particularly, this is specifically the role of organizations and specifically the role of government in picture. So John Dunlop redefined or maybe added one more definition or added one more dimension with his definition whereby he brought out the significant role of the government. Now when we look into a wider coverage inclusive of all sectors specifically the International Institute of Labor Studies has defined it as a social relations in production. So again the context is of a particular production house, a context is of a particular organization where, organization where some activity could be manufacturing, it could be processing, it could be anything related to generation of labor or generation of work or something there where people are coming together to do something whereby some input is converted to output and there is some source or some generation of a product or service. So this is specifically the all round context whereby people come into it and there is social relations that is happening. So these are some of the contexts in which you have to understand industrial relations. Please note again during this class I will stress on two factors employee, employer. We cannot have any industrial relations without or by undermining these two factors but that said I will go with Dunlap by bringing in a third dimension, the effective dimension of the government or the authority in actually trying to solve or mitigate any problem, problem if any or maybe to bring out laws or acts so that any problems are or problems are not there in the first place. So let's look into industrial relations basically from how it has emerged. We have tried to discuss it uh, in the introduction video also but I will try to set uh, or cement the entire understanding of industrial relations from its background. Industrial relations specifically spring from the contacts between employers and employees and specifically the trade union. So there, there should be some, some organized segment or entity to actually represent the employee. So when the employer is let's say there might not be any case of exploitation. There might be a, a case of just ordinary work but again there might be some conditions which the employee might be feeling is not right or might think that it is not safe or might be thinking that it is not the conducive environment that he or she prefers to work for or work in. So in those situations, in those particular arena, in those particular circumstances there emerges an association formal, informal as equivalent to trade union. So they represent what is the problem with these individuals, what are the issues that are concerning these, these workers and they are represented at a top level. So this is what industrial relations try to solve in the first place. Now that said, such relations and contacts prevail at various levels and various forms. So it is not that initially organizations were there and suddenly one fine day industrial relations came up, trade unions came up on one fine day and they started working or deliberating or listening between them. That's not the case. At every single level we have seen that at, at individual level, at uh, organizational, formal, informal, at, at all the interaction level we have seen that there exists some sort of interaction, some sort of deliberation which is which may be represented, which may be uh, directly or indirectly initiated by the employees in the first place. So please understand the modern industrial organization specifically is based upon two large aggregates. So the point of employee employer comes more into a refined fashion whereby I try to bring in two aspects. One is 
the accumulation and aggregation of large capital in one hand. Please note the accumulation and aggregation of large capital on one hand and similarly the accumulation and aggregation of large number of workers. So there, there comes an uh, entity or set of two entities whereby you know the whole relationship is formed. One is aggregation and accumulation of large capital. This makes things happen. This makes factories. This enables to set up organizations to produce something or to maybe process something. So capital is basically the life force power of any organization or any company. Similarly, on the other hand, we have a large accumulation and aggregation of workforce, which again happens to be inevitably the source of the life force power of the entire industrial relation. So please note, when we look into the modern industrial situation altogether, there is a large accumulation and aggregation of capital in one place and there is a large accumulation and aggregation of workforce in one place. Let me put it like this. Let me synthesize this as this. When there is large accumulation or there, when there is availability of large capital and when there is availability of large workforce specifically, which are divorced from the ownership of the means of production, it is sine qua non to what is known as the establishment and growth of modern day industry. I repeat, it is sine qua non to the establishment and growth of modern industry. So please note, these two are the entities, these two are the aspects which bring or drive the entire set of industrial relations together. So the center of industrial relations is coming together with these two big aggregates. So without the existence of this, there could not be or there would not have been any discussion on industrial relations in the first place. Please note, the entire context of industrial relations, the entire context of worker versus the, uh, the employer, the entire context or the relevance of trade unions in representing the employee, everything comes with the existence and establishment of these two large entities. So the background, the basis of this entire course is all about these two entities. One is the accumulation and aggregation of large capital and the accumulation and aggregation of large workforce. Both are vital, both are important, both are critical for the organization. There is no denying the fact, but that said, the, the interrelations the interconnections, the convergence of both, all these aspects actually make what is known as industrial relations. Now let's quickly look into the dominant aspects of industrial relations. There are two important aspects specifically seen in modern industrial society and the first one rightly is cooperation and the second one is conflict. So it is easy to say that every, not only in industry, but also in every single dimension of life, we see cooperation and conflict. In family, we see cooperation and conflict. Uh, let's say in the school where we study or in the, in the institute where we learn or teach, we see. In the organizations where we work, we see cooperation and conflict. So dominant aspects of industrial relations happens to be cooperation and conflict. It is not big rocket science. But please understand the number, the basic large accumulation and aggregation. Again, I'm using the adjectives large accumulation and aggregation. So the fun part is or the interesting part is the number. The, the high number or the massive number, the colossal number itself makes the whole dimension of industry relations more interesting. Please understand, cooperation is a normal feature of industrial relations. Anything and everything will not survive if there is lack of cooperation, if there is conflict at your workplace, you will feel the mental stress. Sometimes it, the body also will take a toll. You may also feel uh, physical stress, physical ill conditions, you know, medical conditions can come up. You might have a stroke, you might have a heart attack, lot of issues will come up. Not only mental stress, so please understand, conflict is not desirable. Cooperation 
is supposedly the normal feature of industry relations but just introspect within your organization what is the normal feature within your organization is it is it conflict or is it cooperation so many of you might be might be thinking or maybe channeled to tell that it is not cooperation rather it is conflict the buzzword nowadays happening in the organization but please understand the normal feature of industrial relations is cooperation so this cooperation flows from the pursuit of self interest by owners of the capital and owners of the labor power so it is not that you are undermining the existence of labor power altogether so in many of my classes in in the b school here generally i talk about something called a strategic intent so strategic intent is somewhere your or individual goals or aspirations or objectives are in tandem or are in alignment with the organizational objectives or goals so this is what is broadly strategic intent so when you are looking into cooperation you should have a, a understanding of strategic intent this is what exactly is happening you are not trying to actually say that there is a, a misconception that you know everybody is working together somebody is sacrificing somebody is compromising no rather it is more of an inherent integration whereby the individual goals are also taking the front seat not at the cost of the organizational goals that's the only difference so it is not about undermining the individual aspirations or objectives or goals rather it is to acknowledge that every individual working in your organization or wo working in in your organization or this organization organization of your reference is individually different and that is the beauty of it we have discussed extensively in some courses about a diversity we have talked about cognitive diversity also so that is the beauty of it there are individual differences and please note it takes all types of people to make this world so in differences are common differences are there differences are the only constant but that said we have to acknowledge these differences then only we can come to a level of cooperation so cooperation please note is not about undermining individual goals aspirations etc but rather than acknowledging the fact now let's look into conflict conflict like cooperation is inherent in the industrial relations setup of today so it becomes apparent totally when industrial disputes specifically resulting in strikes lockouts etc become frequent so it need not exactly lead to strike you know take a step back and look into your organization there might have been issues where you know your organization might must have uh, faced internal conflicts or internal departmental conflicts whereby some of the established projects were not finished in in time in the particular timeline or there might be a breach in the deadline mainly because of the lack of cooperation that happened or i'll put it rather than the lack of cooperation more of conflict between different individuals their egos or maybe departmental egos or maybe departmental uh, dimensions or equations so all these aspects we would uh, know is happening in our organization so it was a factor in understanding industrial relations so conflict like cooperation happens to be one of the dominant aspects of industrial relations so i i think that this uh, understanding that cooperation and conflict though they are in uh, diametrically opposite poles the relevance is clearly understood now let's look into evolution of industrial relations so the origin of the origin of industrial relations is again in employee employer relationship so time and again i have already mentioned that i will try to ascertain this differences again and again or this particular concept that the, the equation between employer and employee is what governs the industrial relations so the relationship between the employer and the employees was informal and personal in the first place so if you look into how the company is developed it did not start on a formalized note never so maybe one or two workers came or we cannot even qualify or call them as workers they came together for a cause for a purpose they started working something beautiful came out so again some product was developed it might have been started as an informal gathering as an informal conglomeration or informal group of workers coming together 
but over the period as more giant uh, joint stock companies came as more professional organizations came the relationship between the employer and employee please note is no longer informal is no longer intimate it is more on a formal basis again try to recall the people who are working or your colleagues they are not your brothers or sisters they are not your friends they are all part of a formal structure who are there to do some particular activity who are paid to do some particular activity so please note in the course of organizational behavior i had actually mentioned that there cannot be uh, an understanding that the, your colleagues are your friends please do not go to that level but i will try to take that leaf out of that course and i'll say that in industrial relations as the size increase as the scale increased more formalization happened and more of a formal setup and a lack of intimacy came up so it is more of a professional setup that has emerged out of this industrial relations and ladies and gentlemen that's what evolution of industrial relations teaches us so when you are looking into specifically evolution of industrial relations factors as the intervention of the state please note we have already brought in the third dimension the state or the government the intervention of the state the growth of trade unions and their federations so basically it it did not restrict itself to a particular community or a particular uh, informal setup rather the trade unions emerged they become so big that they try to feed even the political parties so their federations employers associations employers because it is not always one way you know as the representations and as the associations and organized setups of employees increase employers also found it critically relevant to have their own organizations have their own collective wisdom to take decisions on or, or have their own collective formalized strength to showcase on so there are some of the employers organizations or associations so all these factors be it the state be it the trade unions and the federations or even the employers organizations all these aspect influenced categorically the spirit and the course of the relationship between employers and employees so we started with the two entities employers and employees but from there we have moved a lot we moved from employers to employees there happened to be an uh, associations coming in for the employees in names of trade unions and their federations employers also felt their insecurity or they also thought the need has come to make a formalized setup of employers union or employers association and not to forget the most important party which is the government also pitched in so these three stakeholders these three important entities also started dictating also started influencing industrial relations so please understand it is no more the simple simplistic interaction between employee and employer it is more of the evolution that is being underscored by these three entities that is the state the trade unions and the federations and third the employers association now let's look into clinically the background of industrial relations when you look into the indian scenario industrial relations has specifically passed through several stages a number of factors including social economic and political have influenced industrial relations in india let's look into social factors anything uh, that emerged from let's say the differences in 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 caste in creed Uh, the problems that uh, you know were faced by a social strata of a particular region or maybe uh, aspects like not including or lack of inclusion of a particular segment of people were all part of the social factors when you are looking into india as a country after freedom specifically it was a totally in a devastated state the economic conditions were very poor we did not have as clearly mentioned in our history 
that we did not have enough of you know even the, the food materials to cater to our population so economic conditions were dire were critical so was political there were a lot of political turmoils that have happened because it was a new state altogether there were a lot of problems that emerged because of new rules new policies and the freedom just the country received from the clutches of the British rule. So all these problems categorically in tandem influenced the industrial relations specifically. So in the pre-independence days if you look, workers were hired and fired just like that because it was some other rule, it was not a ownership based mechanism, they were always behaving as invaders. There were always situations where people were not considered as one's own as a principle of demand and supply governed industrial relations. People were just considered, just considered as factors of mass production. They were not given the human element. They were not considered as human beings even. There were episodes of torture. There were episodes of exploitation that happened to our workforce. So please understand, the industrial relations have to be seen from that background, how it emerged from the pre-independence era. In the pre-independence era, we did not have the control. There was, there was an entity which was more in, in working in, in more of an exploitation way or exploitative fashion. So that created social unrest, that created economic unrest and that obviously had political unrest which resulted in the freedom. Now when you look into the first world war period, at the end of the first world war, there were hardly any laws, there were hardly any laws to protect the interest of workers. So this is not only specific to the, the situation in India, the situation was quite same throughout or across the globe. So as mass production came in, issues related to workforce also started emerging, but it was not till the first world war that people tend to understand and acknowledge that there are issues and we have to work together collectively to actually solve these issues. So these are certain factors or certain pointers in the industrial relations background we should acknowledge and understand specifically. When we look into the timeline specifically, I have given you a timeline where numerous strikes and disturbances happened during the 1928 to 29. So if you look into the industrial relations background, the timeline specifically, 1928 to 29 would be significant in starting with our understanding. We will see that this particular time zone would have initiated lot of strikes and disturbances which I was otherwise talking about with vis-a-vis -vis the problems associated with the socio-economic crisis, the problems associated with the political unrest, the problems associated with the combined effect of all these factors. In 1929, as a result, the government enacted the Trade Disputes Act to enhance the early settlement of industrial disputes. So you will un understand that by the time there were a lot of disputes that were compounding. So this warranted, this specifically warranted the need for such an act, Trade Disputes Act, whereby all these disputes have to be considered and some relevant and significant actions have to be taken. Otherwise, a state of anarchy would be setting in, at least in this organization. So, to solve the issue, to have a clear-cut understanding and have a clear-cut problem solving, the Trade Disputes Act 1929 was brought in to enhance the early settlement of these industrial disputes. Come 1938, in order to meet the acute industrial unrest, prevailing, the Bombay government enacted the Bombay Industrial Relations Act. So, Trade Disputes Act had its own limitations. That is quite evident that the unrest and the disputes kept on increasing and 1938 happened to be a seminal year or a watershed moment where the Bombay government enacted the Bombay Industrial Relations Act. So, please note, it is the pre-independence era that we are actually talking about. Now, industrial relations in the post-independence period, after independence, one of the significant steps taken in the field of industrial relations, as I've already mentioned, was the Industrial Disputes Act of 1947, which gave the autonomy to the Indians in actually bringing out a more effective law. So another development in the immediate post-independence period was setting up of the Indian Labor Conference, ILC, a tripartite body 
to look into the IR problems in India. So after taking over the, the control in 1947, the political masters of the country decided that this happens to be, industrial relations happens to be one of the critical scenario, one of the critical problems that the country is facing. And because of this, we have to take a serious action. And as a result, many critical initiatives were taken, not to forget the Industrial Disputes Act of 1947, and also the establishment of Indian Labor Conference. To also note an important characteristic feature of IR in the post-independence period was the change in government's attitude towards labor and their problem. And this is quite relevant mainly because there was more of a sense of ownership that came in here. There was more of a sense of belongingness that came in here because now the people who are ruling or who are ruling are no more foreigners. Now the people who are ruling are more, uh, you know, uh, equally contributing to the nation's economy, if not more. They are more responsible towards the workforce of the country. They understood that if we have a healthy and efficient and effective workforce, it would be for the betterment of the country. So the important characteristic specifically undermined during the post-independence era was a change in attitude towards the workers. So please note, there has been, you know, a lot of oppression, a lot of exploitation in the pre-independence era, but things started getting better after the post-independence era. When continuing the timeline, we'll see that in 1966, the National Commission of Labor, NCL, was appointed by the government. So again, the government was very keen in solving and mitigating the problems faced because India was not a small country. It was a country with large number of population and so was the workforce and also came with that a lot of problems. So to solve that, the NCL, National Commission of Labor, was established in 1966. In the early 70s, we witnessed considerable industrial strife and loss of large number of mandates. So again, the exploitation and the problems were not totally solved. There were issues that pertain to a lot of or that emerged into a big industrial strife and unfortunately the country lost a large number of mandates. So in the late 70s, if you look into the late 70s and the early 80s specifically, industrial relations in India were characterized mainly by violence. So people started understanding that they are not getting sufficient salary, wages. They are not getting sufficient benefits for what they are creating or what they are producing for the owner. So there was a mismatch in expectation. There was a mismatch in the expectation of working condition. There was a mismatch in expectation of how people were treated. There were a lot of issues and that ultimately resulted in violence. So the late 70s and early 80s undoubtedly but unfortunately was more characterized by violence. In 26 July, on 26 July 1981, to meet the situation of the industrial strife, the government issued an ordinance to ban strikes. So it went on to that level whereby the, the employers were not able to sustain that violence, they were not able to curtail that violence and the government had to intervene. A new law, please note, a new law called ESMA, Essential Service Maintenance Act was also promulgated. So these were some of the corrective measures that happened in the early 80s or the late 70s as the as the unrest grew so please note that government as a as a critical entity or critical stakeholder also came into picture and tried to intervene and solve the particular issue so when you look into the entire sort of industrial relations in the background you will see that things had emerged from the mere employee employer orientation or equation it has gone further there were other stakeholders like the government, the trade unions, the employers organization that came in. So it has evolved gradually. But again, as the workforce was high, as the people coming into the workforce, the number was massive, there were still issues, disputes emerged, industrial strikes were there. So the government had to bring out the whip and had to bring out some of the regulatory measures like ESMA. That said, let's now quickly look into uh, functions of industrial relations. We have looked into the background of industrial relations. We have looked into the evolution of industrial revolution, industrial uh, relations. 
we have looked into the background of industrial relations. Now we quickly look into the functions of industrial relations. The first and the foremost one is negotiation. Now you will see that as the entities or the stakeholders increase, now you are not dealing with employer and employee alone. We are not having a direct conversation between employer and employee alone because of multifarious reasons. Could be One could be that the number, the massive number, the colossal number was one of the reasons. The approach was different. The attitude was different. So negotiation came in as a result of more number of entities, more number of stakeholders coming into picture. The first and the foremost, the employer, employee, then the trade unions, the federations, the employer organizations, and even the state. So all of them came together negotiations started happening, negotiations in the line of let's say wages, benefits, uh, salaries, etc. in the employee side, negotiations such as efficiency in production, effectiveness in bringing out innovative products or maybe increasing the number or revenue of the organization from the employer side, having a safe working condition, having a, 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 a efficient working condition whereby the country could progress from the government side or from the side of the state. So all these stakeholders tried to pitch in with their own agenda and negotiation was a critical aspect or critical function of industrial relations. The second important thing was conflict resolution. Please note, as employees increased and the friction between employers and employees increased, also other stakeholders supporting and backing these two segments or these two entities also increased. They found that industrial disputes or conflicts was normal. It happened to be the norm. Rather, we had already mentioned about the cooperation and conflict. Cooperation should have been the norm, but conflict emerged as the norm. So basically, conflict resolution also came in as a significant function in industrial relations. So there might be issues pertaining to the working conditions. There might be issues pertaining to the wages, the perks, the salaries, the benefits, or maybe uh, some harassment in the workplace. So all these factors that came in the purview of conflict resolution that made this conflict resolution a significant function of industrial relations. The third aspect was collective bargaining. When the entities increase, when there are people to talk for or on behalf of employees, when there are organizations to talk on behalf of employers, when the state itself is intervening with its full authority and power, there happened to be conglomeration or establishment of a collective bargaining setup. People found empowered. You know, the employees found themselves empowered, the employers were empowered, the state thought that we should be also party to the whole discussion. So collective bargaining also happened to be a function or landed out as a function of industrial relations. Employee representation. When more and more employees came in, it was difficult for every single individual to uh, represent himself or herself uh, to the higher management because the number itself was very high. So trade unions, first the informal organizations, then the formal set of formal organizations, trade unions, the federations all emerged whereby people started negotiating, people started representing and employee representation came up as a function of industrial relations. Then came the compliance with labor laws. As more and more of workforce was increased, people were increasing, uh, increasingly working in the work environment. Employers were trying to bring in more capital, as I've already mentioned, delicate balance between the large aggregate capital and the large aggregate workforce. All these came into picture, which created or which warranted the state, the government to interfere and to make a clear-cut understanding to both the parties that these are the set of the laws by which you have to play the game or else you will find yourself in trouble. So this was the reason, this was the justification why labor laws were coming into picture. They, they came in as part of the necessity for employees but also gave a boost to the employers to be considerate and also to work towards synchronous way, work in a synchronous manner towards 
a particular objective or a particular goal. When you look into industrial relations, employee welfare and well-being is also one of the most critical function. It does not stop at the factory premises. Work or the work culture or the work aspirations or the entire work in itself does not stop at the organization. The employee happens to be an asset of the organization. This basic understanding actually led the employer to give or to add on some of fringe benefits, some of more benefits, maybe welfare schemes like pension, other social security measures whereby the individual in itself, he or she is happy to come to the organization, put his or her maximum work and actually uh, work in a place where it gives them the, the happiness and joy to work. So this was part of the employee welfare and well-being. When you looked into industrial relations, listening or the license between all these factors, all these entities, be it the employer and its representations, employee or their representations or the state, everybody had to liaison between these segments and these communication, these deliberations warranted a proper, proper channel of communication between these parties and this emerged yet again as an important function of industrial relations. So was policy development and so was training and development. Policy development at the stage of the state, at the, at the state level, the government understood that there should be some policies which look into not only the, the working conditions but also, also the welfare of the people, also the benefit of the large workforce which can actually contribute to the economy of the country. So the training and development was also nurtured in that way or also directed in, or oriented in that way whereby the employers were actually motivated to do or give the workforce better training, thereby they could emerge or harness more and more useful potential work hours. So uh, when you are looking into the entire training and development protocol, the industrial relations happens to be one of the significant factor which initiated the requirement or the need for training and development. And that is why even today, people give a lot of weightage or maybe a, a chunk of money or the chunk of revenue or their asset is, is actually directed or oriented towards training and development for this reason because they found out that to keep the employees updated, keep the employees fine-tuned is always for the benefit of the organization. And finally, monitoring and evaluation also emerge as a function of industrial relations. So anything which is not monitored, there are chances that this may go unnoticed or this may go in a wrong direction. So all the significant stakeholders emerged as significant parties to monitor and evaluate in terms of the employer, they had an evaluation of these employees. In terms of the state, they, they looked into the checks and balances with respect to the organization, with respect to the labor courts, with respect to the labor laws. Every single aspect was checked and whether the organizations are breaching them was carefully monitored. With respect to the employees, they were looking into how uh, proper working conditions was given as per the law suggested, how proper fringe benefits or other uh, benefits for their welfare or their welfare measures were given as given by the policy. So all these monitoring also came into picture. So please note, as the first lecture, I try to introduce you to the world of industrial relations. We started with the discussion of two factors. One is the employer, another is employee. Please remember, as the evolution of industrial relations happened, we found a third significant entity which was the state coming into picture. We found other significant entities like the employers association, the employees association. We also found that people came together, all these factors or all these uh, entities came together to mitigate conflict because initially though the corporation was the norm as more and more of the number of workforce or the people within the workforce increased, the conflict also increased. So please note, this is the background of industrial relations. This is how industrial relations emerged. We have looked into the pre-independence and post-independence era, with specifically with respect to India. But we have also tried to ascertain, or I also tried to give you a feel of why these 
uh, uh, specific entities came into picture or why there was need for let us say something like a trade union, why there was need for something like the intervention of the state. So, all these matters I hope uh, would uh, give you a clarity on why we require industrial relations. We will go with finer details in the next class. Till then, take care. Bye-bye.